Hello, Dean Boyer, and uh, I know that sh last year in 2012, you've just been appointed as uh, as your fifth term yes. of the dean of the college, and according to this time by 2017, the time we will be graduating from the college and the end of your fifth term. In to which direction you want to lead the college at the University of Chicago too, and Meanwhile, while you are maintaining the spirit, you've just explained to us through over a hundred years of history of the university, what else changes you want to do to a college? Thank you. Okay, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, if I could just uh, reframe the question slightly, if this is the old politician's trick of answering the question you wanted to answer, not the question you were asked. Uh, <laughs> I'll try to answer your question, the question I, I, I also want to answer. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, the um, universities are, uh, you know, if you think about uh, most of the great universities in the world, uh, um, the, um, the, 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 the we hope that there are institutions that are going to last a long time. Um, and I hope that the University of Chicago, not only in 2017, but in 2117 and 2217, is as distinguished and as, uh, as, uh, as glorious and as, uh, as prestigious as the university today. And I wish that for Stanford and Harvard. I hope that Peking University and Renmin University and uh, Fudan University are, are even more distinguished and more successful than they are today in, in, in China, etc., etc. Um, but if you look at the, the, the history of universities, you see that they, 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 under the veneer of continuity, they have to change. Um, and so, um, uh, and, and if they don't change in smart ways, they will change in not smart ways. They, they, the change will be forced on them, and they may be pushed in ways that they do not want to go or should not go, as opposed to kind of leading in ways that they should go. And so the, it's, it seems to me the, um, the, um, what any academic leader has to figure out, whether you're a president or a dean, or, and I think our alumni have a role in all of this, because in some ways the alumni are the conscience of our university. They, they are, they are, uh, the proof of the effectiveness of what we do and the success of what we do. Um, we all have to be willing to um, say, okay, the following elements of our tradition are very important. We're going to protect those, but, but there are other things you know, we're willing to change. We're willing to do new things. Um, and so let me give you an example of that. Uh, the, um, um, I mentioned, um, I showed this map about all of our international programs. Now, um, in 1992, when I started as dean, we had no international programs. So the university was very insular. It was a very distinguished university, a very prestigious university. But the attitude on our campus was that if you made it to Hyde Park, um, you know, wherever you came from, uh, whether you know, from New York or Chicago or Hong Kong, whatever, you should stay right in Hyde Park for four years. No, don't go anywhere. Uh, if you tried to leave Hyde Park, you'd be out of your mind because you had made it to the world's greatest university. Um, and um, this was the situation I encountered when I became dean. Uh, now, I thought this was a very foolish idea uh, and a very backward idea, uh, a very parochial idea, because I, as a young person, had spent a number of years of my life living in Europe. I, I'm a historian of Europe in, in my other life. I, just, I write thick books on the history of the Austrian Empire. Um, and I'm perfectly willing to come back and give the history on the lecture on the history of the Alfred Empire. I suspect it'll be a smaller crowd. Um, and um, I, th I had learned a great deal from living in Europe, uh, and counting other people, other cultures, and other languages. Uh, uh, and there were other faculty, it turned out, who thought the same way. So how, what could we do? Well, um, we decided we would take a part of our core curriculum, which is the, each student in our college has to study a year of history. And we said to ourselves, well, if you could study Chinese history or European history in Chicago, you could probably study Chinese history in China or European history in, in Europe, maybe in Paris or Vienna or Rome. And so we created uh, programs where our students would come with our faculty to places like Beijing or to Vienna or to Paris, and um, they would study. And uh, I, 
I encountered a great deal of skepticism. In fact, I created a, a great deal of hostility. And I, I don't know if you've ever heard of, uh, of these uh, vacation resorts where you can go to, as young people, you have with, with the skimpy bathing suits and usually holding a cocktail. They're called Club Med. Okay, Club Med, have you ever heard of that? I was accused, believe it or not, I mean, this is really a, a outrageous. It's shocking. But I was accused of creating Club Med abroad. Uh, that I was going to destroy the University of Chicago by uh, diluting the rigor of our curriculum by sending these American students off to these foreign places. Uh, and who knew what they were going to do in these foreign places? But everyone was certain they weren't going to study. They were going to go, because it, and, uh, as you probably know, don't all make a rush to the airport. Uh, there is no real drinking age in Paris. Uh, uh, the wine flows freely. Uh, and there are other many attractions in Paris for young people. I'm not going to label those. Uh, and so uh, it took a while to get people convinced of all of this. And, and, and look now, we have all of these programs. In fact, we are very proud of the programs. I have waiting lists of fact we want to go on these programs. They're not club men abroad. They're very rigorous. Um, and this is an example of, of, of combining something that is, you know, venerable requirements. Every, every student should study history, but you don't have to study in Chicago. You can study in Beijing. Uh, now, as a native of, of China, you might say, well, of course, that's obvious. I mean, China is a great city. Why would you want to come to China? But again, we had never done anything like this before. The universities tend to be very conservative. Uh, they, they tend to hold on to what they have. Um, so they do need to be able to change. So that's the, the, the prologue. Now, to answer your question, um, I think uh, uh, all the American universities are facing a couple of big challenges, uh, and, and they're going to have to deal with these challenges whether they like them or not. One challenge is, this idea, is, the, is the question of distance learning, uh, of, of you know, learning electronically. And you've all heard that MIT and Stanford are developing these computer-based courses uh, online uh, where not only you and you and you and all of us could take a computer science course by somebody being taught these, the people in Bangladesh, people in Kenya, people in you know, Ecuador, you could all be online taking the same course. You could have tens of thousands of students studying with a professor who sits in Stanford or, 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 at, or at some place in California. Um, and um, there's a lot of discussion about this in the United States and among the American universities. You know, how much of this should we be doing? Um, and there's enthusiasm for it, and there are also people who are worried about it because you know, a university is a community of people who come together to learn from each other and I happen to believe, I'm a little old-fashioned, uh, but I happen to believe that we can learn a lot by talking in person, not only in class, but in the dorms, after class, as you, you know, walk around the campus, make friendships. And, and that's not quite the same thing as being online with people in, in Ecuador or in Kenya or in, um, in southern Illinois. Those are all you know, the right places, but it's not the same as having a residential campus. So, could it uh, be that if we carry the logic of this online learning to an extreme, or carry it too far, that we would end up destroying the very institutions which have made possible the creation of these uh, of this kind of learning, namely the residential research universities uh, of the United States or, or, or elsewhere? So, but that's one issue that we're, we're going to have to be dealing with. And I don't know the answer to it. I, I know every university is going to do some of this. Uh, my own view is that we should do it very slowly and carefully, and we should do it in a way that reflects well on those values, or those core values I articulated. Um, and, um, and we have to be very conscious of the fact that we are a community that lives together and communicates, and, uh, and we must, must not damage that. The um, second issue that uh, American universities are facing is, is, is the cost, the issue of cost. Um, we are a private university, we charge fees, and the fees are very high compared with Europe or certainly uh, uh, this part of the world. Now, we, are, we have a very extensive system of financial aid uh, where we support uh, students from uh, modest family backgrounds. Um, but the logic of the universities is that we depend upon these high tuition, um, at least some of our students paying full tuition, which is a great deal of money. Uh, how long can we continue to do that? I mean, how long will the American people pay these high fees uh, you know, in Europe, there are some universities that have tried to create, you know, tuition fees, 500 euros, and people are out marching in the streets, and they're like, this is terrible, you can't do that, this is outrageous. Um, I, I was thinking, that, you know, if they only knew what we charge people in the United States, wow, you know, 
there'd be a revolution on the street. Um, now I happen to think, you know, the American universities are the best in the world. I, 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 I hope you all, that's not a chauvinistic statement. Uh, if you just look at all the rankings. The uh, rankings are funny, by the way, because if they're made in Britain, you'll, you'll know that the Oxford and Cambridge and the University of London always end up at the top. You see that? Uh, uh, I'm not going to comment on them, why that happens, but it strangely <laughs> happens that way. Um, but, but, but in fact, most of the great universities in the top 20 are American universities, and most of them are private American universities. So I would argue that the, 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 the cost of going to a place like Chicago or Harvard or Stanford, it, it's, it's a good investment. And people, I think, but, but, so, but this issue of the cost of, of operating higher education is another big challenge. And the uh, universities are going to have to uh, think about it. Uh, and um, so those are kind of global issues. I, in terms of our campus, I, you know, I think we're we're doing very well. Uh, we ended up very high in the rankings this year. We ended up uh, number four in the U.S. News rankings. We, we knocked Stanford out of the top. Um, and the people in Stanford are not happy about this. So <laughs> they are they're going to counterattack. In fact, right now they're counterattack. <laughs> uh, and so I can't predict what will happen. Uh, but but the uh, we we've been doing rather well, uh, and, and so I, I, I'm not anticipating any radical changes during the time that you or your friends would be on the campus. Uh, it will, uh, it's a, it's a very great university, and we need to protect it. But these other issues about cost of uh, the cost of running universities, how who's going to pay, pay for it? The American government is withdrawing federal research funding. It's not increasing it, uh, and then this issue of, of uh, Electronic learning. These are very, very big issues that are are, um, uh, are, are on the horizon that we're all going to be having to face. Let's go. Let's go here. I, I do want to tell you that uh, Rick Schwetter talked here uh, last year in May, and he told us that uh, the Habsburg Empire has a lot to tell us about the future. Good. Well, that's fine. Except remember, it did collapse. So <laughs> I, I <don't> <laughs> well, thank you, sir, for your great speech. Uh, I have a question regarding the history. You mentioned that the University of Chicago was built upon the essence of German research university. So I would like to ask how it relates now with the undergrad college. And the second question is that um, we know that in the United States there are eight schools in the Ivy League in the East Coast. So how do you compare the, the University of Chicago with these Ivy schools? Thank you. Okay, l l let me answer the second first. Um, the, um, <laughs> The Ivy League is a um, uh, basically an athletic league. The, the, the institutions, uh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, uh, Columbia, they, they, the athletic teams play each other uh, in, in sports. Uh, but but the, there's an academic side to the Ivy League. It's called the Ivy Plus Association. And um, the uh, Stanford and MIT and Chicago, University of Chicago, belong to the Ivy Plus. So it's, this is, sounds rather paradoxical, and maybe even slightly bizarre, but Chicago and Stanford are Ivy League institutions. They, they belong to the Ivy League, but not to the athletic side of the Ivy League. Okay. So the way we relate to them is we cooperate, uh, we, we have meetings together, we give each other advice, we compete with each other, uh, because students are applying to all of the institutions that I mentioned, yeah. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Chicago, Stanford. Um, Many talented students will apply to all of them when they want to go to college, and, and you can only go to one college, so you have to make a choice. Um, and um, recently, we have been very successful, uh, and uh, we this year we had more applications than Yellow Princeton did. Um, uh, and that's not, not a good or bad thing. I'm simply observing that we've become a fairly attractive place for the very, very best, uh, uh, a very attractive place for the very best students around the world. Um, I have enormous respect for all of the uh, institutions in the Ivy League. They're all they're all a little different, though. They, they all have their own, their own story about themselves. They have their, their, their so someone who comes to a group like this, and if you come from Stanford, you're going to tell a different narrative. You're going to talk in a slightly different voice about Stanford than about Chicago. You come from Yale, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to give the Yale or Stanford speech, although I could. But, but I, that's not my job. I'll let them come talk for themselves. Um, but I, I think the, the fact that Chicago is a Midwestern institution, founded when it was founded, uh, by these very humble Baptists uh, who did not want to have a kind of elite country club kind of institution, but who wanted a large urban institution in the middle of the United States, 
it set us on a trajectory which was somewhat different from some of the other Ivy schools. And, and that's neither good or bad, but it, it's just different. Uh, in terms of the um, how we relate to uh, 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 in, in, in terms of your first part of your question about the German Research University, um, the what the Germans, um, you know, what, what do I mean by that? Well, the, the Germans discovered you know, over the course of the 19th century that a university should be something more than a teaching institution. It ought to have faculty who do original research, and they ought to be given the resources and the time, they ought to be given sabbaticals, they ought to be given research assistants, they ought to be given great libraries, so that they could do research. Research is not only for the good of society, I mean, you know, because all kinds of new things come from research, but also that people who do research, people who do original research and then write books or, or, or articles, that they're, they're kind of on the cutting edge of knowledge and that they can teach students on a higher level. They can challenge you as a student. Um, I can challenge you as a research professor in ways that I might not be able to do if I, if I, if I myself am not living in a world of continually renewing my own knowledge, okay? Otherwise, I'm using maybe these old lecture notes that I used from 20 years ago, and I go in and I read them, and you know, and you know that because you've talked to older students, and oh, Boyer's going to come in and read the same old lecture notes because Boyer's never had a new idea in the last 20 years. Well, the way you prevent that from happening is to say to the faculty, go out and do research, and not just as a young faculty member, but also as an old older faculty member, keep doing research because it, you know, it keeps the gray cells going, as it were. Um, so that's what the Germans, uh, um, their, their, their great insight, I mean, and, and the German universities were also great teaching universities. So the Americans uh, sitting in New York or Chicago in 1890 look at these German models and, so, and, and they said to themselves, wow, this is, this is, this is a great, this is, we want this too. <clears throat> so they sent young Americans over and, and as I mentioned in my talk, it's really quite remarkable that over half of our faculty had PhDs from German universities. So it was uh, uh, in 1890, But the, the, the problem with the German model was that uh, the German universities were state institutions. They were financed by the government. They still are financed by the government. And the story that I just told was these, these Baptists were not they had, they had no connections to the American government. The American government in 1890 did not finance universities. It left it to the states, and it left it to individuals who would buy the idea of philanthropy, private individuals contributing. So my story you know, began with, um, with this guy. Um, so in a way, our state, our government was John D. Rockefeller. He gave us the money. Um, and but Rockefeller was a little different from the government because Rockefeller didn't put any strings attached. He didn't say, well, you have to do so and so and so and so and so and give you money. Rockefeller was remarkably enlightened in the sense that he thought, I'm going to give you a lot of money and you just go out and do good things for students and have research. And so what happened was the Americans um, took the German model, but they then, because of the cultural conditions in which they were implementing it, the lack of state gov governmental support, the need to go out and raise money from the community, the American universities, I think, were always much more conscious of their, their, their rootedness in their cities, their communities. Um, they were much more, uh, you would say, um, conscious of, of um, what people thought of them uh, and how effective they were, because I can't go to an alum and say, you know, please help, help the University of Chicago if I haven't done a good job of providing good education for that person. They, they would say, like, are you crazy? Why should I support you? Um, I came to the University of Chicago and you wasted my time. Um, and so um, the, the whole process of these universities is, a, is, is an example of cultural bower, borrowing, but then you know, the local cultural traditions uh, being mixed in. And um, I think that's happening today. I mean, you have uh, 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 all over the world, there are, there are s states, governments trying to create great universities. but. Uh, we, we get a lot of um, uh, foreign university leaders who will come to the University of Chicago. They always ask to see me because I, I, I'm the historian. I, I can tell the story I just told. And they'll say, well, uh, you're very high in the rankings. You're number eight in the Shanghai rankings. Uh, you're you're eight, eight out of five. Can you tell me how, how did you do that? 
And, and, and uh, what they're really asking is, is it good, like, uh, for how to do it. It's like you're going to go to a, like a fix it up store or a, like a home improvement store and you know, build your own university. Uh, and I always tell them, look, it, it, uh, uh, with all due respect, I, I, I understand what you're saying to me, but it took us 120 years to become a great university. And um, as, I, as I said, we almost kind of lost our way at a certain point. So you know, even great universities can do uh, uh, make unwise decisions. Um, but that the uh, that the uh, that it is not easy to attain greatness as a university, and it's not even even more difficult to stay at the top. Uh, and uh, so that, that's really what I meant by the German system. We borrow from the Germans, but we put it in a very different cultural context. Okay. I'm going to let Tomer have a question. Thank you for your talk. He went to Columbia. Where'd you go? I went to Wesleyan. Wesleyan. Oh, sorry. Just a question. I think another institution, I don't think founded by the Baptists, but I think the Methodists, who also founded Northwestern. There's a great irony in a sense that the school that's so well known for economics in a school that could have a Black Scholes theorem and that could be a, a, the pillar of modern finance could do so poorly in terms of its financial planning, exactly at the same time that it was developing all these great financial theories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the role of the economics department in the last 30 or 40 years in terms of the endowment and the fiscal management of the school? Um, uh, I, I think the um the, the first part of your, your the first part of your observation before your question is a, is a very uh, an interesting one, um, and I guess you could say well, uh, in a way that answers helps to answer the second part, namely that the the, the economists actually had very little role in the management of if anything. <laughs> maybe they should have had a bigger role because we maybe we would have made wise, wiser decisions. Um, uh, the um, Economics was a distinguished department between the two world wars, and even in the time of troubles of the 50s and 60s, it was one of the departments that actually was able to sustain its level of international prestige pretty well. Um, whether it was number one or not, I don't know, but, uh, uh, and, uh, but it's been fortunate in, in being able to recruit each, each uh, generation has been able to identify enough young talent to kind of grow them up uh, so that you have this, uh, you know, this wall of uh, Nobel laureates in back of being. Uh, and a number of them came as young people to Chicago. We didn't, you know, bring them as you know, distinguished full professors with their chairs. Um, the financial problems that the university had, um, I, I don't think were an issue of faulty investments. Actually, the investments that we had, we managed rather well. I think the um, financial problems that we had were really this. Um, uh, a kind of shortfall of resources and a failure to uh, understand uh, that no great university um, can survive, much less flourish, flourish, without having a reasonably large, successful undergraduate college at the heart of the institution. And uh, certainly when I came to Chicago as a student in 1968, when I joined the faculty in 1975, the self-understanding of the university was, I, I, this is, I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit, but basically this is a doctoral institution. This is a graduate university. When Regenstein Library first opened, it was called the Graduate Library. Now, if you think about that, okay, well, what does that mean? Does that mean the undergraduates are not allowed to go in the building? There was actually some talk about that. Well, you know, this great library should be for the doctoral students, because there were a lot of them. They were kind of underfunded. Many of them were not very happy, um, uh, and so forth, but there were a lot of them. Now, of course, the undergraduates ran in the building the first day, and they solved the problem by just squatting. It quickly became the library, not the graduate library. Uh, but the, um, uh, the university lost sight of the fact that, um, I think it was something that Harper came to understand, uh, certainly Ed Levy and Larry Kimpton, and more recently, Hugo Sonnenschein understood, the, and, and certainly Columbia, and, and, uh, and even though you can go to Columbia, Columbia, uh, people at Columbia understand, they really, they, 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 Columbia University is not going to be a really vibrant and successful research university unless Columbia College does really well, is properly sized, does an excellent job in educating its students, 
happy the students really leave feeling not only they got a great education, but they were well treated, respected as human beings, bonded as a community, and then go forth. Uh, because your undergraduate alumni are really going really to carry the institution, uh, along with the alumni of your professional schools in terms of your philanthropy. It's just the way the system operates. Um, I think it was the failure of the university to understand that, to apprehend that, uh, and to really work at it uh, that really got us into a lot of trouble financially. Plus the fact that um, you know, it was one of the great ironies that we got so much money from Rock the Rockefeller so quickly, and so almost afterwards. So you get into, you need something, you get on a train, go to New York, go to Broadway Avenue, knock on Mr. Rockefeller's door, oh, there's another million dollars. Um, and after a while, you get used to that. Um, and, but Rockefeller was always very clear, at least he thought he was clear, I don't think he, he was that, if they were listening to him as much as they should. Uh, this is only contemporary, guys. This is only for a while, but we, I expect you to cultivate the city, people in the city. I expect you to develop vibrant alumni you know, networks. I expect you to, um, to do the things that universities need to do to survive with a, with a much more uh, a broad based community. And um, I think it's fair to say that, you know, really. Congo did not develop a mature fundraising operation until the 1980s. I mean, long after our IB peers had were doing much, many, very professional job. Um, and um, it's, uh, it, it, you, the U.S. News uh, rankings use uh, contributions of undergraduate alumni as a proxy for student satisfaction. I think that's a very crude thing. But you know, they, you know, they will say, well, what else do you want us to use? So, you know, if, if you're an alum of you, you went to Wesleyan, okay. Did you give a donation to Wesleyan? That means you felt that Wesleyan did you did you did well by you. Okay. So, uh, uh, 20 years ago, our alumni contribution rate of our undergraduate alumni was, I think, around 16, 17 percent. Is way, like, way below the Ivies. This past year, we're kind of in the middle of the Ivies. So uh, we're at like 40, 41 percent. So there's been this enormous arc of change. Uh, which is a good thing, um, and we've, we've had to work at that. Uh, and, and I have to say that I've spent a lot of time thinking about that, and there have been some skeptics on the campus who are like, why do you worry about stuff like that? You know, like, we're great, we're life of the mind, you know, great books, all this stuff. Like, what, what are you worrying about alumni contributions? Or, you know, it seems kind of like prosaic or something. Um, I said, no, 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 this is really important, guys. We've got, we've got to worry about this. And it turns out that the, um, we've done a number of things to strengthen, uh, I think, strengthen the undergraduate experience in Chicago. What's driving are the younger alumni who are way, way, uh, our, 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 our senior class gift now is the highest in the Ivy Plus group. So, uh, and that did, didn't just happen. We had to look at it. So it's not the, I don't think it's the, um, either the absence or the presence of the economists, however brilliant, and they are very brilliant people, but it's the, uh, if you don't have the money to invest, uh, all, all the investment strategies in the world are not going to help you. So. One, one last question. Any, any other high school students? Anybody else? Okay, well, I'm going to have to go to Jacob. Jacob, here is one of your, uh, one of your projects. He's an ongoing project. <laughs> a, a project? Uh, yeah. Everything is a project. Okay. I guess you could call me that. Okay. Um, I'm the difficult one. So uh, I'd like to broaden the picture a little bit. Okay. You touched on this um, a bit during your speech, talking about how, like, I guess, the uh, community relations of the university and kind of like um, kind of degradation of the, the neighborhoods around the university. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the way that the university has managed the relations with its immediate surroundings, i.e. Hyde Park and Kenwood, and how, like, since, I guess, the 1960s and how it continues to manage those today. Okay. Um, the short, uh, let me just give you a, a bit of historical background. When the university was founded um, um, on the south side of Chicago in the 1890s, the area in which it was founded, it's called Hyde Park, was a village. It was a rather semi-rural area, and it was uh, a fairly uh, upper-class area. And, and in fact, the uh, uh, the uh, founders of the university chose this area because they thought that this was where a lot of wealthy people would come to live because they were, um, they, I guess Rockefeller was telling them, you know, find other wealthy people, not just me. Uh, and uh, what happened, of course, is, uh, is 
Chicago evolves, uh, that Hyde Park and Kenwood, uh, Hyde Park and Woodland especially, don't become wealthy areas, but they do become lower middle class, uh, middle class areas, uh, population. Uh, the area to the north, Kenwood, is a more of a mansion district. Uh, and they were you know, fairly stable communities. Uh, actually, uh, my mother uh, and father lived in, in Woodlawn. I, I was actually born in Woodlawn. Uh, I'm not going to say when I was born, but I was born in Woodlawn, uh, about a mile from the University of Chicago. And uh, uh, when my mother was a young woman, she went to uh, Hyde Park High School. It was uh, an all-white high school, uh, attended mainly by working class and oh, lower middle class children. Uh, <laughs> The south side of Chicago was the demography, and, uh, the, the cultural demography, the culture and demography of the city changes rapidly after World War II because the, there was an in-migration beginning in World War I and then over the course of the 20s and 30s and during World War II of, of, uh, of, of, of African American uh, people from the south who ended up in the black belt and because of racial discrimination involving restrictive covenants uh, so landlords banding together and not renting or, or uh, selling property to blacks, the black population was kind of ghettoized uh, in, in, in farther to the north. Uh, the Supreme Court in 1947-48 declared those covenants illegal. And so you have the opening of a real estate and property market to African Americans, and the African Americans begin to move into Hyde Park, and especially into Woodlawn. Um, and many of these people are poor. Uh, Many of them are disadvantaged, and um, you know, it is a fact that crime rates begin to go up exceedingly. So you get this uh, uh, response on the part of the uh, of the uh, of the Caucasian population, white population. There was always a small Latino and Asian American population, but it's mainly Caucasians. Um, to um, uh, uh, basically, we're going to flee, <coughs> you know, white flight. Or we're going to stay and try to do something about it. Okay, so the university was um, left in a situation of um, it couldn't flee. Uh, they had to stay. There was nowhere else to go. <clears throat> and um, the university decided to, uh, um, because the city was a fairly uh, city government was fairly ineffective in the 1950s, um, to undertake its own leadership of urban renewal. Um, and this meant. Um, Fairly substantial destruction of sub uh, 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 properties, especially rooming houses, apartment buildings, uh, and um, um, many of them were inhabited by poor, poor African Americans. And so, the university was seen as, and did, in fact did, uh, engaged in what was later called by critics Negro Negro clearance or Negro removal. Uh, and it's, it's a very complicated uh, uh, story, and I've actually written about it. I, I, I've been writing various monographs on the history of the university, and the one that's going to be published in a couple of weeks, I have a, a long section where I try to sort through what happened, when it happened, who did what. Um, and um, the, from the university's perspective, they were trying to save the university because they, they, they had a very profound sense that if they couldn't have a stable neighborhood with low crime rates, stable neighborhood, um, that the they would not be able to get students or faculty to live in the neighborhood. In the long run, the university would, would simply not. Uh, it, it might sur have survived, but as a kind of a third-rate institution that would have been um, that university that we know and love. On the other hand, um, uh, the African-American population, uh, local leaders basically came to hate the university and, and were very suspicious of the university sometimes. This was a very, very dark and bleak time. One gets the sense of an almost a Sartre and no exit, that whatever people did was either misunderstood by the other side or that people understood very well what each side was doing, and it was like ships passing in the night. And, um, it was almost tragic. Uh, um, to fast forward, the urban renewal did work, and, 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 the, and the community was stabilized. And Hyde Park now is, I think, one of the safest communities within a large urban environment. And it is a multiracial, biracial community. Uh, it has a large uh, uh, African American population. It has a relatively growing Asian American population and a fairly large Caucasian uh, and Latino population. Uh, so that the, if you argue the end justifies the means in a kind of Jesuitical sense, uh, uh, the, uh, what the university did in the 50s and 60s, there's a logic to it, and, and at least in the end it was successful. But there were a lot of human costs and a lot of people having to leave their homes and be forced out. 
and, um, um, and a lot of bad memories and distrust. So the, I mention all of this uh, because it, it's that ambient culture, anything that the university does with the surrounding community, those images are still in play. Okay? It's, it's, it's as if it was yesterday, although it's 60 years ago. Um, what we've been trying to do um, is to um, uh, not try to tell people forget history, although I do think it's important that people try to understand actually what's, what, what happened, so that's why I tried to write about it. Um, but to say, okay, look, uh, where are we today and what can we do going forward? And um, we've uh, launched a number of different initiatives. I, I think the one of which I'm rather proud because I, uh, the college has played a, a role in, uh, along with other parts of the university in formulating it. Uh, we announced earlier this year a program called University of Chicago Promise, East U Chicago Promise, where we um, uh, said to uh, any student in any high school, uh, public or Catholic high school in Chicago who applies and is accepted to the University of Chicago, we will waive all loans, uh, uh, we will provide you with the requisite financial aid. Um, we will treat you as if uh, you were maybe a part of the Odyssey program, uh, which is our most generous scholarship. Even if you don't need it uh, on the basis of need-based aid, we're still going to support you. Um, we um, have mobilized a group of college students to go out into local schools to advise uh, uh, students, and we're talking largely about a very majority African American Latino population in, in these schools, to advise kids about strategies to go to high school. There are many students in Chicago uh, who could go to really a good college who don't know how to apply. They're, they're afraid to go away from home. There are a lot of barriers, and so we thought maybe we could break through that. Uh, we, what we we're trying to do is mobilize the university, the resources of the university, to help the high school youth of the city of Chicago advance themselves by, uh, to better themselves and their families by getting into four-year college with good financial aid packages. Uh, this is costing a lot of money. I, I think the cost of UC Promise this year is going to be about $3 million. We're just spending, and we weren't spending last year because it's a new program. So that's one example of an intervention to try, uh, I'm not trying, trying to make away the time trying troubles in the 50s go away, because it, it, you know, it happened, you can, you know, you can make judgments about it. But I do think that this is a, it's a good question because it, it, it points out a larger issue, and that is to say, what's the responsibility of a big university in a city? You know, this university, this university, or Pekin University, or, um, or, or, or Columbia University, or Wesley, or the University of Chicago, to its broader community. I mean, are we a kind of an island, a kind of monastic community, where we're saying, we don't want you, we don't want you folks in? Or, or you can only come in on our terms, you know, like we'll have a concert, we'll let you come to our concert, then you, you know, leave. Um, or do we see the universities as outward-looking instruments uh, of productive change, but only change in which we're working with the communities, not telling the communities what to do? And I think that um, one of the things that I think has been very helpful to us is uh, by sending, uh, by getting the university to focus on the, uh, on the very pragmatic and real strategies for internationalism, um, we've also gotten the university to focus on strategies that for, the, for the city of Chicago. Because if, if I can send people to Beijing or to Vienna or Paris, I ought to be able to think about ways to send students in to the south side to, to help, to tutor, to, to, to improve the schools. Um, and it's interesting, we've done, we did the international before we've done the local, but the local now is following the international. So I, I think the uh, uh, it's a complicated story. All of the universities uh, uh, in America that are in large cities have had similar kind of narratives. And um, uh, uh, we have to be hopeful that the next 50 years will, will be better than the last 50 years. <laughs>